Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, more than two centuries old, is a big part of the borough's future. The Weeksville Heritage Center hits 50, and its new head talks about its role in black history. And Chinese New Year, entering the year of the dog. Hi, and thanks for joining us. I'm Ashley Ford, and we've reached Valentine's Day. Feels like this year is more commercial than ever. But don't we say that every year? Speaking of a commercial, or ad, or I guess announcement, there is this item in Brooklyn that's been getting some attention. You may have heard by now, a young woman saw a guy wearing yellow shoes on the G train. He was kind of cute, had shaggy hair, she was wearing green pants, she was smitten. She posted on Miss Connections to the yellow shoes guy, can't be too many of those. Well, someone saw the post and blew it up into a 20-foot billboard and put it on the side of a Williamsburg building, daring the guy to show up at 1 p.m. February 14th to meet his love. We'll find out if it worked. But this made me think of those other Valentine's Day misconnection posts out there that aren't getting as much attention. This one, titled DeKalb Av Stupidity. You were smiling, I smiled, you frowned, I frowned, and then we laughed. This is just a shot in the dark. Okay, kinda haiku-ish, but you're not giving us much to go on here. We're not, we're not gonna find this person. That's not gonna happen. Um, let's do the next one. Tall, white male, Carhartt jacket, Bushwick L. You were eating peanuts and kept making eye contact with me. You sat across from me and had on a purple Carhartt jacket. Do, do they come in purple? Well, never mind. And a backpack with long hair in a ponytail situation. You got off at First Avenue and gave me a super cute, teethy smile. Then looked back at me regretfully before the doors closed. Then stared into my soul as the train passed. Okay. That's a serial killer. Do not respond. Repeat, do not respond. And the last one here, cute boy at the taco truck near Bedford L. This is a man looking for another man, by the way. So if you're a chick, don't answer this. It's not for you. It was 4 a.m. in line at a taco truck in Williamsburg. You wore dope bread Yeezys. You asked me what kind of burrito I ordered. Mad regret. Yeezys. You know, these sneakers cost about $1,000. But my question is, who wants to date a hype beast? Hope y'all make your connections. But me, I'm connecting today with the executive VP of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's blowing up. Also, sight, sounds, and symbolism of Chinese New Year in Brooklyn. And Weeksville Heritage Center, site of one of America's first free black communities, celebrates 50 years. But first, these things. On Tuesday, a Brooklyn court ruled that officers were justified in cuffing a dying teen while he lay on the ground after being shot seven times by the NYPD. The police alleged at the time that the 16-year-old Kamani Gray from East Flatbush aimed a gun at them, but some witnesses on the scene said he had his hands up. Here's a Valentine's-inspired entry, starting with a quote. I must be part canine, because the parts of New York that are most mine are the sidewalk corners that I've cried all over. This from Brooklyn programmer Kate Ray, who made a map of the places she's cried in in the city, and it allows others to map their own stories of crying or other intense personal moments. For me, this inspires reflection on the places in the city that have more to do with emotion than working, commuting, or consuming. Consuming unless you were wolfing down lots of pie from the pie store while you cried. It's been known to happen to people. Also fittingly for Valentine's, it's Condom Awareness Day. I'll let you decide what that means, but be aware of where your condoms are and know that if one's been sitting in your wallet for a while, it's probably got a hole in it and it's dry as a, a bone. Dry as a bone. Coming up, our next guest. On January 31st, the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation announced a plan to add 5.1 million square feet of manufacturing, creative, and innovation space. 
They expect this will also add 10,000 more jobs to the 20,000 jobs already promised by their current expansion. In addition to employment opportunities and futuristic tech spaces, the revamped Navy Yard aims to create more moments for interaction between it and the communities outside its walls. Maybe this will happen at the deli counter at the new Wegmans, also slated to open there. Here to walk us through the plan is the executive vice president for the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, Claire Newman. Thanks for coming on the show, Claire. Thanks for having us. We're very excited to be here. That's a long title. <laughs> Does that I know all fit it's a on mouthful, your card? So you know you can abbreviate it. You can do acronyms, and then it really rolls off the tongue. I yeah. don't know. Will it? Yeah. Like I the think book. So. B Y works. Yeah. Tell us what you do at the Development Corporation, though. Sure. Um, so I am the chief of staff at the Development Corporation and have that cumbersome long title. Uh, but <laughs> primarily what that means is that I oversee a lot of the development that's happening there. And so the master mm -hmm. plan you referenced in the opening statement doing the urban planning part of that, doing a lot of the community engagement, which we do in partnership with you know, local, local stakeholders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then the fun part of actually making all that happen and trying to get these businesses at the yard and create those jobs that we care about. How is this different for different than working with a for-profit mm -hmm. um, development? You know, because like, yeah. I feel like when you talk about for-profit development, people mm -hmm. start. Mm -mm -mm. I always make sure to clarify that at cocktail parties. Um, yes, <laughs> yes. But um, yeah, I think the main thing that's different is that we're we're mission driven, and mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, as opposed to being a kind of for-profit developer where. I'm looking at my bottom line and how much rent I can get from somebody who's coming in our doors. Mm -hmm. For us, it's much, much more that we look at. And what we think about when we recruit tenants and when we develop space is less about maximizing profit and more about, is, is are we giving this business a growth opportunity that they wouldn't mm -hmm. otherwise have in Brooklyn? Are we making a difference in terms of the economic landscape of our local community? Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we're creating a home from, for businesses that might not otherwise get to be in the five boroughs, right. and making sure that the jobs they create are something different than what you see in New York. New York's really good at creating jobs for people with master's degrees, and it's really mm -hmm. good at creating jobs in retail and service. Um, but for jobs that are accessible, but also have real middle class career ladders, that's mm -hmm. much rarer. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do at the yard every day. That is absolutely true, by yep. the way. So help me understand, you've got an expansion going on right now. Yeah. And now you announce another expansion. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a lot. Yeah, it's you know the we're, but we're not done. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so that for us, I think you know we're always challenging ourselves to add more space and to do more of this because you know as I said, we really do face moments every day where we have businesses being like, I need to grow or I'm going to lose my space. Do you guys have space for us? And so we can't really let our foot off the gas. Um, we're in process right now of adding, um, going up to 20,000 jobs, and Ooh. we have like 2 million square feet under development. Mm -hmm. But when we're done with that, we're going to have finished rehabbing all the buildings that the Navy left us when they moved out in 66. Um, wow. And with real estate, you really have to kind of get ahead of that cycle. And so taking the time right now to be like, when we're done with that, what comes next? How do we make sure we keep a kind of drumbeat of space coming for these businesses mm -hmm. and for people who are looking for jobs? And so we asked ourselves, um, what kind of manufacturers need to be in New York City and right. really create true career opportunities that make sense in the 21st century? And how do you decide that? Yeah. Like, talk to me about that because yeah. you know you're talking about there's artists, yeah. there are innovators, there's yeah. like there's gonna be a Wegmans. Totally. I'm very excited about the yeah. Wegmans Ever, you personally, be. definitely. Um, yeah. But how do you I, like you say yeah. you like these people who will you know like be able to get an opportunity here that they wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. have been able to, but also that bring the value right. of jobs that people can grow into and grow with. Totally. Um, but what does that like? What does that look like? Yeah. What does yeah. that look like? It gets a little wonky, I, <laughs> but I'll, I'll get into. When I started at the yard, whatever it was three years ago, I had this right. idea that we were going to like figure out the one sector, right? Mm -hmm. The one sector that makes sense in New York City, and that you know we would focus on robotics or this one thing. Um, and then, as it turns out, what we learned through going through the strategic planning process, mm -hmm. and we worked with some great people on that, um, but looking at data, doing interviews with people in the field who are you know, thinking about these things and where innovation is going, is that the sweet spots for New York City is really more about value add into the product. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it's unlikely a manufacturer is going to move to New York to make 100,000 white v-neck t-shirts, right. right? 
But we have manufacturers at the yard who are making tables that have artificial intelligence in them, or there's you know, a shirt with wearable technology. Because for New York, the real competitive advantage is integrating that manufacturing with high design. Like, mm -hmm. think about New York in terms of the creative talent it's here, right. and high technology. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's a real rationale for manufacturing businesses to do that in New York, because you want to be near the tech talent, but you also want to be near this like bed of manufacturing Absolutely. talent that still exists. Yeah, and maybe you don't make a hundred thousand, but you make a thousand. Yeah, and that still creates all those jobs on the assembly line, running CNC routers and stuff like that. Excellent. Yeah. Wow, this is really interesting. Thanks. Talk to me about you know like one of the things that I see all the time with the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Most of the time, I only see it when like I'm in a car and we're mm -hmm. like making that long drive. Or maybe your car got towed. Or maybe your yeah. car got towed. Not my car because yeah. I don't have a car in New York, so I'm smarter than that. <laughs> like it's so easy to get towed right. here. But anyway, it's all right there. Mm -hmm. But it seems mm -hmm. like a place where I'm a hundred percent not supposed to go. Right. So how do we? How are you working on making it feel more accessible yeah. to the public? So first of all, you are supposed to come to the yard. Please okay. come to the yard. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that's a big focus of ours, both right now and in the master plan. So we, um, you know, look, the Navy left us with this gated community, basically. And mm -hmm. and the gates have a huge amount of value for our manufacturing businesses, because they like they run these big trucks everywhere. They have stuff on the loading docks. And um, you know what it's like in New York. Like, oh, yeah. To actually have space to do your business is valuable. Right. Um, but it doesn't need to be that the face we present to the community is like, stay away. Right. Um, and especially along the edges of the yard, there's, there's a lot happening where there's more public access. So we mm -hmm. have, we just opened um, Building 77, mm -hmm. which is a million square feet. It's going to be home to 3,000 jobs. But relevant to your question is it's right on Flushing and Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. And so we took that opportunity to pull back the gate. And the whole ground floor now is going to be totally publicly accessible. And it's a huge space. And what we did down there was food manufacturing. So we're kind of like ha -ha, having our cake and eating it too. <laughs> but um, doing the manufacturing jobs, but also creating like an actual reason for someone to come down. Um, right. So Russ and Daughters is going to be our anchor tenant down there. And so, you know, for everyone who's sick of waiting an hour and a half in line at the yes. Russ and Daughters Cafe, you should still go there. Russ and Daughters is great. But there's going to be... there to get my chocolate totally. babka. And we have the Food Sermon, who's going to be a tenant there. They're like a really popular Caribbean spot, um, currently up in Crown Heights. And so they're going to have a second location where they both serve food, but they're also manufacturing hot sauce. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like a really easy way to come and get involved in the yard. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, you know what, Claire? Thank you so much for being here and for sharing all of this with us. I think a lot of people now <laughs> have a better idea of what's happening yeah. <laughs> and get excited about what's happening at the Brooklyn. Navy are. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. We can't celebrate Black History Month in Brooklyn without recognizing one of the most crucial pieces of black history in the borough. Bed-Stuy's Weeksville Heritage Center, which is located on the site of the 19th century free black community. This community served as a refuge for blacks, both those fleeing slavery and those escaping racial violence and draft riots in northern cities. By 1850, this was one of the largest communities for free blacks in the pre-Civil War U.S. To tell us more, we have with us Rob Fields, the new executive director of the Weeksville Heritage Center. Rob, welcome to the show. And thank you for having me. Can you really quickly tell people, and it, like just, really succinctly what the Weeksville Heritage Center is and why it's so important. Sure. Weeksville, the Weeksville Heritage Center sits on the site of an historical African-American free intentional community. It was the second largest free African-American community in pre-Civil War America. Um, it is in what is now known as actually Crown Heights. It's very close to the border of Bed-Stuy, but it actually is in Crown Heights. And by the, it was formed in 1838 by a group of African African American investors who got their money together and bought land from the Lefferts and the Garretsons, you know, wow. um, that, who owned a ton of farmland. And that community was marketed quite literally to other African Americans across the country to come and build this community that would be this haven, this refuge. And by at its height, there were 500 people living in, wow. in Weeksville. So every day, mm -hmm. every single day, you're able to look out at the historic Hunterfly Road mm -hmm. every day. 
When you see that small village, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, the what, what I have the privilege of looking out at are the three remaining original houses wow. that were from that time on the last remaining stretch of Hunterfly Road. So mm -hmm. um, I am quite humbled, actually, to be in a leadership position of an organization like this that has such this, the organization has a 50-year history, if you count uh, to the back to the rediscovery of the houses, which were almost lost to history um, and rediscovered in 1968 prior to them almost being demolished by the city, because right. that's what the city does. It's like nobody's using these. Let's yeah. build something. Um, but also, obviously, Weeksville's history goes back 180 years, mm -hmm. and so to be in a position to sort of help amplify that history and take that inspiration of what these 19th century African Americans were able to build in an era before emancipation, and certainly well before— What was life like for them? Um, it was— um, it was a challenge, but, you know, because they had to do everything. You know, they right. had to grow their own food, but they, they did that. They, they traded among themselves. They ran their own businesses. It was, um, I guess you could say it was a, uh, a fulfilling community, and, and, they were, and, they, and even though they were their own community, they didn't hide away from the world. They were involved in pretty much every struggle for equality that was going on at the time, to the, from the black convention movements, to the voting rights, to, wow. you know, whatever was going on, people in Weeksville were involved with. So they weren't just like, well, we'll hide out here and maybe nobody will notice us I kind like of that. thing. So they were very much involved. I love that. So what are some program highlights over the next few months? I know you're in a brand new facility, yeah. right? Yeah, the, the center itself has been, was um, thanks to the support of the city and the design genius of Caples Jefferson mm -hmm. Architects. Um, they designed us a LEED Gold Certified Building, and that's been wow. open since 2015. Um, it's a 23,000 square foot visitor and cultural center where we have art galleries and multi-purpose spaces and classrooms and our office spaces now, so we've got room to actually invite the community in for a bunch of new programs and existing programs. We always have, uh, on second Saturday of every month, we're doing our Weeksville weekends when we open up the facility to the community. We provide community and family programming, free tours, things like that. Um, we are going to be launching new programming, such as Words at Weeksville, our literary series, which I'm really excited about, programmed by Bridget Davis. Um, and we're going to have a ton of great writers coming. We've got February through May program. Dennis Norris and Crystal Satal and Katu Ulis are kicking us off in February. We've got Uzo Iweala, who wrote Beast of No Nations, wow. and Greg Pardlow coming in March. We've got Tiari Jones coming in May. Oh, we, so you know, we're also <laughs> going to be doing a, 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 an adult writing workshop. We're mm -hmm. going to be activating the gallery. I hope to soon be able to announce our artist in residence program that's going to mm -hmm. be doing reintroduction interpretations of one side of one of the houses. Wow. So um, there's going to be theater programs we're doing, partnering with um, some well-known theater entities around the city, some black theater entities around the city. So we're just trying to make this a place for convening and conversation right. and the arts and just bringing those kind of experiences to central Brooklyn mm -hmm. um, so that we can enrich this community and make yeah. this a, 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 a viable and vibrant place on the New York City cultural landscape. And as you celebrate mm -hmm. your 50th anniversary. The 50th of the rediscovery of the houses. Of the rediscovery of the we got another houses. 50th coming up in 2021. We actually formed the, the, center? the, the Society for the Preservation right. of Weeksville and bedford stuyvesant oh history. God. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of celebrating. Lots of celebrating. So can you tell me really quickly, why is it so important for Brooklynites to remember Weeksville? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, what we say is that the most important thing is knowing the history, not for the, not, one for the fact of its existence, the fact that disproves a lot of ne negative stereotypes around African Americans, that mm -hmm. lazy, we're not industrious, we're looking for handouts. Here's an example of people who 
were exactly the opposite of that. They were entrepreneurs. They were some of the first, first in many of their, many cases, first black female doctor in New York State, third in the country, the first black principal in a public school, you know, things like that. First black police officer in Brooklyn, out wow. of Weeksville. But it's also important to take the inspiration that they provide to help us kind of deal with the challenges that we face today. And I think that's a site of, of inspiration for not just African Americans, but for all Brooklynites and all New Yorkers. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here, Rob. I really love that you shared all this information with us, and hopefully we'll have you back to celebrate another one of those anniversaries. Yes, weeksvillesociety.org and hashtag Rediscover Weeksville. Rediscover Weeksville. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Friday is Chinese New Year, based on the lunar calendar. And according to this calendar and this tradition celebrated by all Chinese communities across the globe, including right here in Brooklyn, it will be the Year of the Dog. Paul Mock, the president of the Brooklyn Chinese American Association, came into the studio yesterday to tell us about the New Year celebrations in Brooklyn Sunset Park. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate having you. Oh, thank you for having me. And I was wondering, you know, throughout the years, uh, via different media, mostly in TV and movies, I've been able to get some sort of a visual representation of the Chinese New Year. But a lot of the cultural story behind it and the significance behind it, I think a lot of people don't get. Like, they get the visuals and they understand, you know, like the dragons and all of those things going through, you know, these parades and towns, but they don't really know what it means to Chinese people. Can you tell me the significance of the Chinese New Year within the Chinese culture? Well, uh, I guess Chinese New Year is really celebrated by uh, almost all the Chinese, or actually all the Chinese in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's the biggest holiday for them. So uh, a couple of things that they do. Uh, first of all, uh, they would definitely have the either the uh, lion dance or the dragon mm -hmm. dance. Uh, actually, it would uh, bring in good luck, as well as to uh, scare away any uh, evils that uh, might be around the year before. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have the firecrackers that also would bring in good luck and uh, to really uh, scare, to really uh, avoid all the bad thinking and all the bad things that are coming in from uh, the year before. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the traditions that they do is that uh, 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 they would uh, uh, wear all the new clothing, the new shoes, and everything would be brand new for them. Yeah. And a couple of days before the new year, they would really uh, uh, spend a day or two to really clean up the house in order to uh, really welcome the new year. Wow. And why is this coming year, or this new year particularly, the year of the dog? What does that mean? Well, uh, actually, uh, uh, the Chinese New Year is really uh, represented by 12 animals. And mm -hmm. uh, this one, uh, the one that we are still in, is uh, Year of the Chicken, a roster that people call that. And the upcoming one would be uh, Year of the Dog, uh, which right. begins on uh, this coming Friday, the uh, February the 16th. Well, um, each uh, animal really represents the uh, different characteristic as well as the uniqueness of the, uh, the that they represent. Uh, for example, uh, for the year of the dog, uh, for those people that were born in the year of the dog, basically they are very loyal, they are very mm -hmm. honored, uh, and they are really uh, determined and to really have a great achievement if they want to. Right. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the Brooklyn Chinese Association and how that works with the Chinese American community here to celebrate the Chinese New Year. Okay. Well, uh, in fact, we are celebrating our 30th anniversary this wow. year. So uh, back in 1988, uh, we start seeing the, uh, the, the, the Chinese population were moving into Brooklyn because of the overflow of Manhattan Chinatown as well as uh, the Flushing Chinatown. Uh, mm -hmm. At the time, um, uh, everything was so affordable, so uh, it attracted a lot of new immigrant population uh, finding their, their new home in Brooklyn, as well as uh, small businesses that were uh, opening up their stores. So uh, uh, in 1988, uh, we, about two months after our formation, we organized the first Chinese New Year parade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, was that in Sunset Park? Uh, in Sunset Park on 8th yeah. Avenue. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, that was the first time that we had the opportunity to introduce the Sunset Park uh, some of the affordability and all the opportunity that uh, that could have offered to the Asian population, and uh, by introducing the uh, the community to uh, to the outside world, basically almost immediately after that, we start seeing um, 
more and more Asian population moving into the area as well mm -hmm. as uh, maybe two or three storefronts that were opening up on a monthly basis uh, wow. that all started in uh, 1988. Wow. So can you speak to why it's so important? Because that is, I mean, even just 1988, I mean, that's the year after I was born. Oh. So 1988 to now, like the what you guys have been able to do as far as not just attracting more of the Chinese population to this area for affordability reasons, but also this celebration to mm. bring everybody together. Can you just tell me about why is it so important to keep those traditions alive in Brooklyn? Well, uh, I guess, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, like many other immigrant communities, they love to stick together. And by sticking together, by uh, coming all the way uh, from different uh, parts of the, 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 the U.S., and they decided to come to Brooklyn because uh, that would be the convenience uh, place for them. So. Um, so little by little, I still recall uh, back in 1990, uh, we did a survey and we had about 50,000 uh, uh, Chinese population within the, uh, the Sunset Park and the Ball Park area. And today, probably, we have almost uh, 300,000 uh, mm -hmm. that are within the area. So uh, it's a big increase. and. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, bring in with them would be the uh, the Chinese cultures that they have been uh, maintaining. So uh, right. it's really uh, according to the census, I think we we have the highest uh, Chinese population within the city of New York. Wow! And uh, the fact that uh, we have one of the highest birth rate uh, within the uh, the city also a harbor between the Chinese population and the Jewish population. So I think uh, we are the, the, the number one within the city of New York. And people who want to come celebrate on Friday, how do they do that? Where do they go? Well, uh, not Friday. We are off on Friday. Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> as a new, as a actual New that Year. Is so new year. Uh, we are having our uh, 31st uh, anniversary uh, Chinese New Year parade uh, this coming Sunday, uh, February the 18th. Uh, so what it is is that uh, uh, the parade uh, will really uh, uh, well, it's two parts. Uh, the first part would be the performance and then follow uh, by the parade. At 11 a.m., uh, we will uh, begin with our grandstand to have a, mm -hmm. a cultural performance uh, by the seniors, by the schools, and uh, by the uh, 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 professional people. And uh, about 12.30, we will uh, uh, be welcoming all our VIP guests that are joining us and offering the greeting to uh, to the community. And right after that, we will have our firecrackers and uh, um, to celebrate our 30th anniversary, not only wow. that we have many, many uh, lion dance uh, uh, that are joining us, but we also have a dragon that are joining us. Fantastic. And uh, right after that, uh, starting at one o'clock, uh, we will uh, begin our parade. Well, I appreciate you being here so much. Thank, thank you, you for much. letting us know. And hopefully you'll have a big turnout this uh, week. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today. This was, by the way, our 50th show. Tomorrow we'll be back with the achievement gap in our New York City public schools. Any press rhetoric, stoked by the orange one. And Soul Science Lab previews their upcoming show, all about the music and culture of the 60s, at the Apollo. Hope you can join us.